that was the first major league move of the entire off season, aside from council, which that doesn't count, of course. And here Imanaga is, and the roster will be set to 39, poss possibly tomorrow. One, two, swinging a drive toward right center. Back goes Robert, back near the stands. That ball is gone. A game-winning home run for Chris Morrell. Can you believe it? Listen to this crowd. Welcome back to the Brotherly Cubs podcast. I'm Javier, and that's Jose. And <laughs> my name's actually Zach, and that's John. We're two brothers who love the Chicago Cubs, hence the name. Nice little pun. Uh, and here we are. We've got some fantastic news. Shota Imanaga has signed with the Cubs, the first major signing of the year. We're pretty excited. Uh, I'm a little sleepy, but just like Jed Hoyer was, I am actually really excited about this. It's a massive achievement to, for them to be able to finally sign somebody, it feels like, even though this is way down on their list. But I am super excited about this. Before we dig in, I was told by my producer that mm -hmm. uh, we need to start with something fun. So it's the new year. It's January 10th as at the time of this recording. Before we dig into Shota Imanaga's statistics and where he fits on the Cubs, I wanted to hear about some New Year's resolution. So uh, what do you think about Craig Council? What is his New Year's resolution as a renowned manager? What is the biggest item for him to do as a Cub this year? I think it's just to utilize the bullpen. I just think that he's going to be able to do a better job with the bullpen. It's one of his resolutions. Yeah. I'm definitely excited for him to dig in with, you know, the analytics and look at this team. And he's got a little bit more of a payroll. I'm curious to see what he's going to do with it. I think uh, Shohei Otani's major New Year's resolution is to not be stuck in traffic for an hour on his way to the game. <laughs> yeah. uh, can, you, can you imagine being late to your own? You're supposed to be at third in that lineup. And there you are traversing uh, Echo Park. Chavez yeah. Ravine on your way to the stadium. And hey, if those games are at seven and you're traveling in there a little bit late, it's 3 p.m. You're gonna be stuck there even at three. So then you gotta climb all those hills, you gotta get there. At that point, he's worn out. He doesn't even want to play. So yeah, I think I, <laughs> I want I want a production of like his journey to Dodger Stadium or something like his car broke down and <laughs> It's, it's just like the camera pans to him and he's like <laughs> and he's like running up the hill and then it pans back into or there's a feed back into dodger stadium and then like someone's thrown out the opening pitch and he's still not there and then it's like he's <laughs> back he is he's in the tunnels and all that i i think it's funny that he went from anaheim and orange county sort of there is traffic there but you get to the ballpark it's pretty easy to get in it's it's on a flat surface on the hill dodger stadium i think shohei's gonna begin to those game times at noon just so he can avoid the traffic that's about the only time in la you don't have traffic between 10 and 1 30 every other time it's a may it's mayhem um some other new year's resolutions for the cubs would be to maybe make the playoffs this year hopefully they can you know take the next step and actually utilize council's managing and sign some players here for Jed. The new year's resolution is just to sign a few more players, maybe sign a second player. Yeah. Um, I let's would not, hope. <laughs> let's not get too selfish. Today. <laughs> have your, whatever your name. So, <laughs> so the first major league move, unfortunately was the Cubs picked up. I think his name is Brett Servin, a third or fourth catcher. Jorge Alfaro was a minor league catcher signing. I think he probably has an opt out at some point after spring or sometime in April. He doesn't make the major league team, gets added to the 40 man. Brett Servin was a waiver pickup, which means he is added to the 40 man roster. So the 40 man was at 37, jumped to 38. That was the first major league move of the entire offseason, aside from council, which that doesn't count, of course. And here Imanaga is, and the roster will be set to 39, poss possibly tomorrow. Imanaga signed, uh, tentatively had agreed, 
uh, yesterday, last night, and thus his physical today should make his announcement official. We got the contract details, so the signing will become official in advance of his deadline, which was 4 p.m. tomorrow. So just a programming note, we were not sure that Imanaga was going to sign with the Cubs. Therefore, prepping for this pod, we were going to talk about where Imanaga went, if there was any update, and we were going to talk about prospects. <laughs> so now <laughs> we're switching gears, <laughs> and yeah. we're talking about the latest that just came out. There's a couple very interesting... Actually, there's three interesting notes. So I'm I'm stoked. So I'm just going to read them off here because I'm in a good mood. And uh, this this signing is, has been a nice boost to my January so far. So Imanaga has been in Chicago since Christmas. Yeah, so for <laughs> so almost three weeks, two and a half weeks, he's been in town. So he didn't have to even fly in for his physical, which I remember them saying, there was news that Imanaga liked Chicago early on in the offseason in December. I think that was around the winter meetings was that he reportedly liked Chicago. The Cubs also signed Imanaga for a better than market deal. Imanaga turned down a deal that was worth potentially uh, double what the Cubs gave him. So I think he did have it. The report was right. He did have a $100 million offer on the table, but he took a lesser offer with the Cubs. Here's the rub. So I've spent about 10 to 15 minutes, if not a little bit longer, trying to dig into this detail. And I'm going to read it off on air as best I can from what I interpreted. The latest that came out, here we go. <laughs> so it's a four years and $53 million deal. That average annual value would come out to $13 million for luxury tax purposes. If we assume that the only guarantee on this deal for both sides is 2024 and 2025 season. So, so potentially two years and $26 million. So let's just say $13 million per year. Then in 2025, the off season. So two years from now, the Cubs have a team option for the foreseeable future, which I believe that would exercise the third and fourth years of the contract. So the two for 26 becomes four for 53 if they decide to vest the final two years. Now, what gets confusing is that at some point the deal becomes three for 39 and the 2026 off season, the Cubs can then go back and decide to amend the deal from four to 53 to five for 80. So the AAV jumps to uh, $16 million a year. So if the AAV jumps by three whole million dollars a year, and that's a massive increase on that deal for just that last year. But early on, if Imanaga sucks or if he's injured, the Cubs can just drop him after 2020. They can only have him for two years. If he gets Tommy John or he tears his shoulder or does something crazy, they can say, see it, and he's gone. Shota Imanaga can also opt out after that third year. So the third year is an inflection point for both sides. The Cubs would either exercise five for 80, or they, they can also stick with a four for 53. So they have two options there. Or if the Cubs don't exercise the five for 80 for the deal in that third year of the deal, Imanaga himself can opt out. So he's guaranteed four for 53 if they exercise in 2025. So he needs to do well for two years to get hit, to get that four for 53. If he does really well, the Cubs can lock him down until the 2028 season. So I had to write all that down. I had to sort of parse it out and think about how it works. And I'm not even sure if I got that right. <laughs> I, I think you messed up in like three different areas. No, <laughs> I was like, go ahead. <laughs> Tell the class. <laughs> and while I was reading something on Twitter, about someone trying to understand like the third year, I think it was from Jesse Rogers. Jesse Rogers, someone had commented on his post uh, or his tweet or whatever you call it now, his ex post. post. Yeah. <laughs> and he was saying, uh, I'm, I don't I don't quite get it or I don't understand. And then Jesse said, what part don't you get? Like, <laughs> and then it was just like, <laughs> and there's just a litany of comments below, but it's, I didn't even understand that far from what I understood. I mean, I think you really delved deep into that contract. Mm -hmm. uh, 
from the language perspective, I don't, I'm not even sure what I was understanding was that it was two years at 13 million guaranteed. So 26, like you said, um, and then after that, they would revise it and figure out there's a team option, right? Yeah. And so yeah, the team option. And then if they decline that, then they, then what would happen? So he becomes a free agent. So let me, let me put it this way. If he has like a, if he has a Tyone type season, 4.8 ERA, I mean, he may still hold on to me. Honestly, if he has an injury and he has a terrible season or two, and over the next couple of years, they can literally just no decline the team option and let him become a free agent. Especially if there's prospects that are outperforming projections. Exactly. That could possibly make the rotation in two years. You know, Jackson Ferris maybe in two years, possibly. Um, most likely you're gonna see Kate Horton there. Yeah. I mean, there's options. I think that's you always want to have, you know, good problems in life. The that's a good problem to have is you know. If he doesn't project or if he doesn't perform well, well, here's our other option. We could possibly look at the bull, not the bullpen, the prospects that we have coming up. So, yeah, I mean, I'm this deal is actually a hell of a bargain. He's making almost as much as a fourth or fifth starter would, and he's actually potentially going poten to potential, potential in. He's going <laughs> to pencil in. I should not say those two words back to back. And that's the one, yeah. <laughs> For now, I think you'll pencil in as a number two. Some some projections are a, a little tricky, and some people think Tyone is a number two. I don't necessarily – I'm sure he could fight his way there. He's got a good fastball. He's got a good sweeper. Tyone, I'm not sure he's a number two yet on this squad. Uh, I'm I'm thinking it's more of like Steele, Imanaga, Hendricks, Tyone, and then Wicks and Assad, and they should try as, as best as they can to create a six-man rotation. Uh, I, I did a little bit more research and just interestingly enough, Imanaga last year had 148 innings, but his average is around 140. So it is actually pretty consistent. His last year is consistent with his overall career numbers. So that's about 26 starts and the big leaguers, you know, 150, 160 games, you go about 30 starts. So essentially you, you could technically still do a five-man rotation, but have him skip four times. Or if you do a six-man rotation for a chunk of the year, especially when Kate Horton comes up, Steele, Horton, and Minaga, if those are your guys, then, and continue with a six-man rotation, Hendricks, Tyon, Wicks, or Assad, vice versa. However you get to six, there's definitely a good chance he'll get under 140 innings. The other benefit to that, too, is you can be flexible and either double dip on your ace so Steele, or if Hendricks is pitching well, you could give him more innings. Also, you can give Wicks and Assad and also Kate Horton an opportunity in a six-man rotation to stick around 130 innings. So I think Horton was between 80 and 100 last year. Give him 30 to 40, 50 more innings. You know, maybe set him under 130. He gets the playoffs. That's a different story. But I, I think a six-man rotation is is on the table this year, especially to keep everyone healthy and not go too far over their innings. Yeah, that's been discussed. I mean, you sent me a, a clip of, or an image of what it looked like when he's pitching on five days rest or six days rest or something like that, I believe, right? And his yeah. ER was like dramatically lower by like almost a full point yeah. or, half, or almost close to a full point each day of rest extra that he has. It's pretty amazing yeah and I, I think what they can do is so four days rest is a five-man rotation so i think they would give him five days rest on a six-man rotation and that seems to be the key um key resting point in terms of not giving him too many days off because you want him to be able to pitch i mean you're it's not like you're paying him 20 to 30 million dollars a year but you're also depending on him to win games i mean you signed him as your prize starting pitcher this offseason there likely won't be any other pitchers in the budget considering they need to sign two more hitters and two more relief pitchers so if you do the math at least on hoskins or if they get a cheaper dh they can make it work bellinger he's going to command over 25 million if you do some of that math with some relief pitchers you start to add it all up and the cubs start to get over the first threshold but under the second threshold spending between 60 and $70 million a year 
on new commitments this off season. So there may, there definitely is not budget for another full starter unless they skip out on relief pitching or if they don't really get an expensive DH. I would say they have to trade, right? I was thinking maybe just kind of spitballing here, but if they package Morel, Wesneski, and maybe uh, Triantos for like a a solid number two starter behind Steele, yeah, they're somehow able to do that. How do you feel about that? Do you feel I, like well, sure, but I feel like Imanaga is going to be like a solid three. I think many people project that mm -hmm. maybe popping out at a two, but I think they need. Well, how how do you feel? Do you feel like they need to still go after a starting pitcher, like a like a bona fide ace, to really compete with teams like the Dodgers and the Braves, or do you feel like they just need to solidify their bullpen more and and lock in some position players? I think trading Morel is is risky, but if it comes at the risk of giving up less prospects. I would totally be down to get like a Jesus Lizardo or I don't know if Dylan Cease will go for that cheap of a, I think he'll t command a ridiculous trade package, unfortunately. But the biggest thing for me is if they did get a number two, then that stabilizes them for the future. And that gives them more runway for their prospects, their prospects for pitching. However, if you trade Morel in a package for a starter, I, I do think that's something that could help push a deal forward, but then you're losing essentially DH slash third baseman. And I actually think it's more likely that if the Cubs feel like they're a starter away at some point in the season, I feel it's likely that they could give up that package that's, you know, wait a little bit longer, wait till there's a little bit more push and pull, uh, the levers start working on the trade deadline you know the gms are a little bit more motivated to work on a deal especially if let's say let me give you a hypothetical matt shaw is going to start at tennessee but let's say in the middle of the season he's in iowa and he's got a still a 1000 ops and hey he's been playing third base if you start to see that happen and maybe you don't feel like morell is playing third very well then you got to trade morell and also because because if you or if you get production at the DH from others, so let me pose this PCA in center, Bellinger first, and then let's say Hoskins, Turner, Belt, someone at DH. And let's say, let's say they were to sign Chapman to, I, I don't know, just a hypothetical. I don't know if they would sign him, but or if they're getting good production on a third. If everything is going well and Morel can't field third, and you have a good DH and sort of those pieces are fitting together, Morel becomes very tradable. But if he's playing third base well and Matt Shaw's not ready and you need some of those components still, I I would wait. Personally, I would love a second starter. I just I don't think they're gonna they they could could have gotten it for money this offseason. They may wait till next offseason and push the chips in a little bit further, especially as they're more confident in their plan. And they may wait to give the prospects until they absolutely see a perfect deal on the table, in my opinion. But I'm not sure if they'll go for a number two this year unless it's at the trade deadline and the money's just really not, it just depends on how far they want to go. If they go up above 260, I think they could get there easily to get um, a starter in the 20 to $25 million range, or maybe they're cheaper arbitration years that, that would help them save some money too. So I could see that being an option. If you could see, I think was the number I'm thinking of is 10 million, but I think that might be Shane Bieber's number. Either way, if you got a, a pitcher, at between 10 and 15 million, I think they'd make a trade for him, especially because they wouldn't go that far above the luxury tax. But I'm I'm on the fence. <laughs> what yeah. what are your thoughts on that? I I kind of how you feel. I kind of feel the same way. I want to see I want to see how our season goes. You know, if we're if we feel like we're very competitive this year, everything seems to be clicking and the free agents that we've signed, hopefully whatever remaining free agents that we've signed are um, putting in the work that we want. Maybe we do make a trade for a starter at the deadline. I probably see that happening more towards the deadline than right now. Um, we could also see how Bieber does, you know, throughout the year up until July or August. And then if he is producing and he has proven to recover from his injury, then we can make that trade. But I, I think 
they're probably going to wait to if they really do feel like they need a, a legit starter that they that they feel comfortable trading uh, pieces for. Yeah, um... also Alonzo too. I mean, there's one of the crazy. I was watching uh, a clip on YouTube from MLB, MLB Network, and they were saying um, Kate Horton and Ben Brown for our Pete Alonso. Mm. I was like, nah. I think I would say no to that. If the Cubs don't trade Ben Brown, I think he's technically the first man up out of Iowa. If he's healthy and he's pitching even remotely well in April and May from what you saw earlier in the year, sort of summer, the beginning part of summer before he got hurt on his way to Iowa, kind of like how he was in Tennessee. If he can pitch for a single month, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they get him to, to eat some bullpen innings and slot him into to some spot starts. Now, I, I still think Ben Brown is... I'm not going to say his ceiling is limited, but he's he still has an incredible ceiling. I'm curious if he's more suited for relief, but also I just kind of want to see him work and and hopefully they get a chance to get him up to the bigs next year. But I'd be okay trading him knowing that the depth is still pretty solid. If it gets you someone great back in return, that means a lot more knowing that Horton will be there. But yeah. I'm greedy thinking about this rotation with uh, when Hendricks either retires or leaves the team, Steele and Minaga, Brown and Horton, and now you've got four guys that can actually strike people out. That's important. You're not just limiting contact and sort of getting ground balls and blue pits and things like that, as Hendricks might do or Wicks or Assad might do. You're actually striking guys out. So that's good to have in your rotation. So it's kind of exciting thinking about all of these these flamethrowers down the minors, and I'm not saying there's a ton of them, but it's been a long time since the Cubs have had legit homegrown pitching that can strike guys out. Right. So it's well, impressive. Um, another note I wanted to make about pitching, as we sort of feel like there's not a lot of room for another free agent starter, the Cubs have, per John Morosi, again, I don't know if I trust this guy anymore because he's he's botched a million things this offseason, but he thinks the Cubs should be in contention for Hater. He did mention yeah, some, something like a shorter-term deal. Now, if they paid him two for 40, remember that Hater wants to beat Edwin Diaz's five-year, $100 million contract, so $20 million per year for a long-term deal. The Cubs just hedged a ton of risk off this in August signing. So I'm curious if the Cubs would be wanting to hedge more risk if Hayter's not getting the deal he wants, if he would sign like a two years 45 or two for 42, something where he's getting a higher AAV, shorter term deal after those two years, he's gone. And then he can he can cash in again on the deal he really wants if it's there. I would, I'd love for that to happen, especially because Council would be his manager, former Brewer, former Brewer, link up, work together, harmony. Uh, a couple other notes for the bullpen, Robert Stevenson and Brent Suter. Those, those uh, names haven't necessarily surfaced, but I think Cubs Twitter is in unison on signing some of them, especially left-hand arm with Suter. They miss on Hater, And the last target that may go unnoticed that I, I still really like, and I'm going to beat the drum until he signs somewhere, is Brandon Woodruff on a two-year deal. I think with Brandon Woodruff, he's going to sign a multi-year deal this year with some team. And the first year may be for five to six million, like pretty cheap. We're going to pay you to rehab, and he might come back in September, and that would be a nice bonus, right? That second year would be worth closer to his market value, 20 million, something like that. Assuming, you know, he rehabs. The Cubs just dealt with this exact injury. They rehabbed Hendricks with a capsular tear in his right shoulder. 3.7 ERA. Those are good numbers for Hendricks' career. Even improved over the last couple of years. If Woodruff can come back with counsel, with the Cubs, rehab this year, make it to them this season, maybe he gets there, maybe not, 2025, now you've got him under control for one more year. And now your top of the rotation is like Steele, Woodruff, Horton, and Minaga. That's stupid good. So if that option is on the table, even if the Cubs would go over that threshold a little bit further, I think that'd be worth it, especially if you could get a front row seat at re-signing Brandon Woodruff. Yeah, I mean, that's, I know you'd mentioned that before. You're definitely high on Woodruff. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, Good. <laughs> The the only thing I guess that concerns me when we're I mean hearing you talk about him was rem remembering I think it was his postseason. Um, how did he perform in the last year, in the postseason? I mean, he had an okay. Yeah, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but if you think about the Brewers as perpetually really good with Council, they don't seem to make a lot of noise in the postseason. So I know in the first round they tend to fizzle out pretty quickly. They made it to the NLCS, I think, in 2018. So if you think about one NLCS with all these playoff appearances, Woodruff and Burns are, aren't making it deep into the playoffs, which is a little surprising given their bullpen is usually really good. But another thing to think about is the Brewers' offense is terrible. It's god-awful, and it's bad every year. <laughs> and it was yeah. it actually looked decent this year with William Contreras and things like that. And Adamas has kind of fallen off, but... They've got some speedy guys that manufacture runs. So their offense is hit or miss. And if it was really good, I think you'd see a lot better results from Woodruff not pitching into a tight game and not, you know, he still has got really good stuff though. He's got a good circle changeup. He's got a almost like a sweeper slider, but he's got it. I think he has a curveball too. He throws 95 to 98. So he's a power pitcher. And that's something the Cubs do not have right now. Only with Cade Horton and Ben Brown. Right. I agree. I think it's a good signing. There's definitely, you know, if you get him a two year deal, like you said, maybe 5 million for the first year, just to pay him to rehab and then, and then pay him obviously a pretty big bump in the second year. Um, that's a great point. I think I, if, if I were the Cubs, I would definitely want to sign him in the back end of the free agency period. I would definitely obviously get the offense rolling as far as Hoskins or Bellinger or Chapman, two of those three, I think we'd be in pretty decent shape. I would personally prefer Hoskins and Bellinger. Mm -hmm. um, I think we could still keep Morel at third and, and see how that goes. Or Shaw, when if he's somehow able to. Yeah. Come. I would definitely be pretty happy with that if the Cubs signed Woodruff at the end of, near the end of free agency, if for some reason he was still available. Yeah, it seems that the Cubs you know, fan community, Twitter, et cetera, is pretty adamant on not signing Chapman <laughs> in terms of blocking Matt Shaw. There's a lot to like about Matt Shaw. Um, if they did sign Matt Chapman, I hope it'd be on like a two-year deal and he'd still have Morel DH. So the only downside to that, your infield becomes really, really good with Bellinger at first. Like you have an unbelievable infield defensively. My issue there is you've now lost, I guess, another chance at a left-handed bat. Um, with Morel at third, the, the Cubs could also go Bellinger at first. And we're talking post, I should say post PCA, but PCA era, right? PCA is in center field playing defense. He's a left-handed bat. Bellinger plays first. If they got Brandon Belt, he was actually among the better hitters the last few years. And he's left-handed. So then they would have half PCA, Bellinger, and Belt for almost half their lineup would be left-handed. If you look at the Dodgers, they have like, I mean, they have Muncie, Freeman, Otani, uh, Galvin Lux. I think they have five or six hitters that are lefty. I'm not saying the Cubs should get to that. They need to prioritize lefties. But, you know, you let Schwarber go three years ago, and that, nowadays that'd be a perfect DH, a left-handed bat. If you could get Belt on a two-year deal or maybe a one-year deal, kind of like Hoskins. I'll, I do like Hoskins, though, because even though he's not lefty, he's a power bat, and that's something... They don't have a lot of them and they've got some consistent hitting, but I want my lineup to be like Suzuki, Morel, Bellinger, Hoskins. I want those four as my power hitters. And I see you've raised your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, let's see. Zoom, zoom features whenever I can. <laughs> uh, I have a question for you. Just um, curious your thoughts about this guy. He's a pretty decent hitter and he has a the ability to influence others around him he has a lot of knowledge uh jd martinez what are your thoughts on him would you sign jd martinez to be your dh yes um uh, i'd like I, well before i hit the yes button on that i'd like to just see if he plays any first base defense <laughs> just if if pca is not ready like let's say pca is just really slug uh really slacking or gets hurt Bellinger is your center fielder, then you need someone to legitimately play first. So I'm I'm going to default to Hoskins. I don't know how well of a defender either of them is, but Martinez is technically a better overall hitter, like a power hitter. 
So if Martinez plays similar defense as Hoskins at first, I almost would like to explore the difference in those deals. I mean, it's possible JD wants like a multi-year deal. And so if that's the case, then that might be kind of a sticking point because the Cubs don't want to lock any position down too long. But I I would say yes to JD Martinez. Yeah, he is. I'm trying to figure out how old he is. Let's see, he's 36. So, oh, oh, I was gonna say 36. I was saying mid 30. <laughs> I don't know how much of a. Yeah, I mean, maybe a, a two to three year deal. I mean, I don't. I don't know how much more. Um, how longer? How much longer he's gonna want to play? Yeah. Last year, just kind of running through his numbers, you know, 33 home runs, 117 hits. Um, two two seventy one batting average and one hundred and three RBIs. Yeah, so it's pretty and good. It's healthy. I didn't didn't have to recover from a, you know an ACL. I mean, I don't. I'm not saying that's some major downplay on Hoskins' market, but it kind of is. I mean, he's only going to get maybe a one or two year deal. Yeah. So and, yeah, I mean, if he's a Boris client to that, that might hold things up as well. Right. That's true. Running through the bullpen options if you had to choose two to sign who would you sign so i'm going for a power righty so either hector neris or robert stevenson and i'm going brent Suter as my lefty although i would take hater on a short-term deal with a cheaper right hander i don't know who that person would be if they had to save money I, I I would prioritize Hater because that immediately stabilizes the back end of your bullpen right away. I agree. I, I definitely think Suter is a strong possibility for the Cubs. Obviously, there's that connection again with Council. Yep. I don't think, again, kind of going back to John Morosi or J.P. Morosi, he thinks that we're going to sign or that we have a strong chance to sign Hater um, or that we should push to sign Hader, but I don't think that the Cubs or Jed Hoyer is definitely going to put in that kind of money for a reliever that he's looking for, that Hader's looking for. Yeah, I mean, it only fits a one or two year deal. If he gets if he gets a chance to reestablish his market, maybe he takes it. And the only other thing there is that Council is his manager, and maybe that's his comfortability for Hader to, I wouldn't say take less money, but take again, a pillow type contract and roll with that. But I don't see it either, honestly. I, I I think if he gets a five-year deal, it won't be the Cubs. If it's over three years, it's not the Cubs. If it's two years, we're back in the ballpark, but definitely not on a five-year deal. They, the Jet has almost never done that on for relievers. Also, we do have a closer in Alzali. He's not an elite closer, I would say. I I wouldn't put up there. I wouldn't put him up there in the top five or so in the game, but you can see what you have with him, and then come All Star break, if the Guardians are still trying to trade Emmanuel Class A, you could look at that as well. He's he has controllable years, and I believe it's fifteen or sixteen million per year mm -hmm. or less. I mean, I think it's less, yeah. Less. I think it's like 13, maybe even. So I would really love for him to be our closer, but that's mm -hmm. a discussion for another day. <laughs> well, we are out of time. <laughs> this has been the Brotherly Cubs podcast. That's Javier, aka Zach. <laughs> I forgot what my nickname was, but I think Jose. <laughs> <laughs> AKA Brother John. And that we will see you on the next one. Adios. Listen to this crowd!